Was there a model or style of glove that you shipped to Bloomingdale's exclusively? Yes. Ms. Femich, who are you employed by? Bloomingdale's. The murder of Ron Goldman, alongside Nicole Brown Simpson, shocked the world. But the gruesome details of his autopsy would send even more chills down the spine. What investigators found in the report revealed a night of unimaginable violence, a struggle for life, and terrifying injuries that painted a haunting picture of that fatal night. The O.J. Simpson trial may have come to an end, but the horrifying revelations from Ron Goldman's autopsy still linger, leaving even O.J.'s family in disbelief. Today, we'll uncover the disturbing truths hidden within that report. But before any of this, let us begin with a little background. Context. Nicole Brown met O.J. Simpson in 1977 when she was just 18 years old, working as a waitress at the Daisy, a popular nightclub in Beverly Hills. Despite O.J. being married to his first wife, Marguerite, at the time and with a child on the way, their relationship quickly took off. Simpson and Marguerite eventually divorced in 1979, allowing O.J. and Nicole's relationship to grow more public. Nicole even had a brief non-speaking role in the 1980 TV film Detour to Terror, which O.J. both starred in and executive produced. However, early signs of trouble in their relationship surfaced, with Simpson reportedly showing signs of possessiveness and hostility. One notable instance, according to Nicole's sister Denise, occurred during the early days of their relationship when Nicole kissed a mutual friend on the cheek after a Buffalo Bills game. O.J. flipped out, leading to an emotional confrontation that left Nicole crying in a bathroom, with O.J. berating her for embarrassing him. Despite these early red flags, the couple's relationship persisted, with Simpson even carrying the Olympic torch during the 1984 Summer Games while Nicole ran behind him, a public display that contrasted with the private turmoil they were already experiencing. O.J. Simpson and Nicole Brown got married on February 2, 1985, five years after O.J. had retired from professional football. It seemed like the next chapter in their whirlwind relationship, and shortly after, they started a family. They had two children together, Sidney Brooke, born in 1985, and Justin Ryan, born in 1988. Both children were delivered via C-section. Becoming a mother was one of Nicole's proudest achievements, according to her sister, Denise. But it also marked the beginning of an increasingly difficult time in her marriage to Simpson. Despite their picture-perfect public appearances, things weren't as they seemed behind closed doors. Simpson, who had been showing signs of control and volatility earlier in the relationship, became more aggressive and volatile after their wedding. Reports of emotional and physical abuse started to surface, although some accounts paint a more complex picture. For instance, Bethy Vaccarano, Nicole's maid, shared in a letter that Nicole could be abusive towards Simpson, even going as far as claiming Nicole was racist and anti-Semitic. There were allegations that Nicole sometimes made condescending remarks toward O.J., even referring to him as large head. However, those close to the couple, like Jennifer Young, recall heated moments where Nicole was enraged over Simpson's alleged infidelities, while Simpson kept his cool in the face of her accusations. But as much as Nicole may have shown anger, O.J.'s treatment of her was far more troubling. Their fights were loud and violent. According to Al Cowlings, a close friend of Simpson, their arguments could be explosive, with Nicole berating O.J. with racial slurs during their most heated exchanges. The public glimpsed the darker side of their relationship on New Year's Day in 1989. On that night, Nicole called the police after O.J. physically assaulted her. When the police arrived, they found Nicole hiding in the bushes outside their house, bruised, beaten, and half-naked. She was terrified and claimed O.J. had punched, slapped, and kicked her during an argument. Despite the seriousness of the assault, Simpson pleaded no contest to the charges of spousal abuse, and Nicole, reportedly under pressure from her family, decided to drop the charges soon after. Throughout their marriage, O.J. quote, S. Infidelity became another major source of conflict. According to friends, Nicole was well aware of O.J. quote, S. Cheating, and it tore their relationship apart. Simpson's old Brentwood friend, Robin Greer, shared in the 2016 documentary, O.J., made in America that Nicole and O.J. would often get into bitter fights over his many affairs. Greer herself even recalled that O.J. had tried to make moves on her multiple times, despite being married to Nicole. Despite everything, 
Nicole tried to make the marriage work for the sake of her children, but the tension and abuse never stopped. It reached a breaking point when, in December 1989, Nicole phoned the police, terrified, saying she thought OJ was going to kill her. And it wasn't just an empty fear. Simpson had made chilling threats, telling Nicole's friends that if he ever caught her with another man, he'd kill her. By this time, their marriage was collapsing under the weight of constant fighting, infidelity, and violence. Although Simpson may have played the role of the charming, charismatic football star in public, their relationship was far from a fairy tale. After seven years of marriage, the couple officially divorced in 1992, but even after their separation, the abuse and control didn't end. The terrifying cycle of emotional and physical torment continued right up until the tragic night of Nicole's murder in 1994, the separation. At the time of their breakup, Simpson dropped a bombshell on Nicole. He admitted to having an ongoing extramarital affair with actress Tawny Catan for over a year. This revelation was the final straw in a marriage that had been crumbling for years due to infidelity, control, and escalating abuse. Nicole had already endured enough, and this confession made it clear that there was no going back. In January 1992, Nicole moved out of the house she had shared with OJ and into a new place in Brentwood, Los Angeles. It was a four-bedroom, Tudor-style rental home on Gretna Greenway. Here, she tried to start fresh, living with her two children, Sydney and Justin, as she attempted to move forward with her life. It wasn't just a physical move. It was Nicole taking steps to regain control and create a safer space for herself and her kids. A month after Nicole's move, OJ officially filed for divorce on February 25, 1992 citing irreconcilable differences. The couple shared custody of their children, Sydney, who was seven at the time, and Justin, who was just four. While the divorce papers were signed, their relationship continued to remain turbulent. Even though they were no longer married, the ties between them were not easily cut. OJ's control and volatile behavior lingered, and Nicole's efforts to break free were constantly met with resistance. Even after their divorce, O.J. Simpson's abuse of Nicole Brown didn't stop. In fact, it seemed to intensify. Nicole confided in her mother, telling her how O.J. continued to stalk her. She would be out running everyday errands, and suddenly there he was, at the gas station, at the Payless shoe store, even driving behind her on the road. It was clear that Simpson couldn't let go, and his presence loomed over Nicole's every move, making it nearly impossible for her to fully break free from him. On October 25, 1993, the situation took another violent turn. OJ reportedly found a photo of a man Nicole had dated during one of their breakups, and it sent him into a furious rage. Nicole called 911, crying, terrified for her life. On the other end of the phone, she could be heard pleading for help, saying OJ was going to beat the shit out of me. In the background, Simpson's angry voice cut through, accusing her of having sex with the man while their children were in the house. He shouted, you didn't give a shit about the kids when you were having sex with him. In the living room, they were here. Didn't care about the kids then. OJ's rage wasn't just about jealousy. He was also lashing out about the people Nicole had started surrounding herself with. He accused her of exposing their kids to drug users, prostitutes, and dangerous individuals. He repeatedly threatened to leave with their children, shouting, I'm leaving with my two fucking kids is when I'm leaving. It was a chaotic and frightening moment, and Nicole was clearly in danger. When the police arrived, Nicole was secretly recorded by Sergeant Craig Lally. In the recording, she described the terrifying transformation she saw in OJ when he got angry. She said, he gets a very animalistic look in him. All his veins pop out, his eyes are black, just black. I mean cold, like an animal. The sheer fear in her voice was unmistakable. She admitted that he hadn't physically hit her in the four years since the infamous 1989 New Year's Day incident, but the emotional and psychological abuse was still very much alive. She explained that when OJ reached that level of rage, it was like something in him switched, and it scared her to her core. It wasn't long after this disturbing incident that Nicole finally moved out of the home they had shared. She made the decision to leave behind the toxic relationship once and for all, but OJ's shadow continued to follow her. The years of manipulation, control, and terror had taken their toll on her, and even after she physically removed herself from the situation, 
the fear of what OJ might do next never truly went away. For Nicole, this was the end of their relationship, but sadly, it wasn't the end of her nightmare. The years of trauma and fear she endured ultimately led to the tragic and violent end that would shock the world. Nicole Full of Life In December 1992, Nicole Brown met Kato Kalin during a skiing trip in Aspen, Colorado. Their friendship quickly grew, and Kalin eventually moved into the guest house on Nicole's property on Gretna Greenway. For a year, he paid rent and helped take care of Nicole's two children, Sydney and Justin, as part of their living arrangement. Despite the media's portrayal of Cato as just a quirky house guest, he became a steady presence in her life during this period, assisting with her children and keeping a close connection with the family. During this time, Nicole was also exploring new relationships. She was linked to restaurateur Keith Zlomsowicz and NFL player Marcus Allen, though her past with OJ loomed large. Despite some rumors swirling around her involvement in the recreational drug scene, there was no solid evidence of Nicole using drugs. At the time of her death, toxicology reports confirmed that her system was clean and her home was free of any drug paraphernalia. In January 1994, Nicole made another significant move, this time just a few minutes away from her old house to a new rental townhome on Bundy Drive. The three-story Mediterranean-style home, situated in the upscale Brentwood neighborhood, offered her both privacy and proximity to the local attractions she enjoyed. The house, covering 3,400 square feet, had multiple patios and a rooftop sun deck that provided a perfect retreat for Nicole and her kids. Brentwood, nestled between the Santa Monica Mountains and the Pacific Ocean, was home to country clubs, parks, and iconic landmarks like the Santa Monica Pier. Nicole's life seemed to be turning a corner, full of fresh starts and new memories with her children. Her sister Denise fondly recalled this time in Nicole's life. In a 1994 interview, she described Nicole as vivacious, so full of life. According to Denise, Nicole was finally carving out her own identity, forming her own circle of friends, and focusing on her children. They had even begun planning vacations together, like camping trips to Yosemite or family adventures to Club Med. For once, life for Nicole seemed filled with excitement, hope, and the possibility of a brighter future for her and her kids. Nicole's love for her children remained at the center of everything she did. She was deeply invested in creating a stable, joyful life for Sydney and Justin, despite the turbulence of her past. The School Function On the night of June 12, 1994, Nicole Brown Simpson's day seemed as ordinary as any. She and O.J. Simpson both attended their daughter Sydney's dance recital at Paul Revere Middle School. It was one of those moments parents live for, watching their children shine. After the recital, Nicole, her family, and friends decided to grab a bite at Mezza Luna, an Italian restaurant in Brentwood. Unbeknownst to Nicole, one of the waiters there, Ron Goldman, would soon become a central figure in her story, but not because he was serving her table that night. Instead, Goldman had become close friends with Nicole in recent weeks, a bond that would soon cost him his life. After dinner, Nicole and her kids made a quick stop at Ben & Jerry's before heading back to their condo on Bundy Drive. Simple enough. But at around 9.37 p.m., things took a small turn when Nicole's mother realized she had left her eyeglasses behind at the restaurant. A quick call to Mezza Luna, and the glasses were located. It was Ron Goldman who volunteered to drop them off at Nicole's place as he finished his shift at 9.50 p.m. Meanwhile, O.J. was hanging out at his Rockingham estate eating takeout McDonald's with Kato Kalin, a small-time actor and friend who had been staying in OJ's guest house. A cloud of rumor followed OJ that night. There were stories that he might have been on drugs, including a wild claim about crystal meth from a local dealer, but later tests would prove all three involved, OJ, Nicole, and Ron, were drug-free. Then things started getting strange. Around 10.15 p.m., Nicole's neighbors began hearing incessant barking coming from outside. It wasn't unusual to hear a dog barking in the neighborhood, but this was different. Brown's Akita dog, typically calm and loyal, was creating quite a ruckus. Fast forward to 10.55 p.m., and a man walking his own dog noticed the Akita wandering alone, legs stained with blood. Concerned but unsure of what was going on, he tried walking the dog back to where he found it, but the Akita resisted 
clearly agitated. That's when things took an eerie turn. The man decided to leave the dog with a nearby couple who, troubled by the dog's behavior, chose to walk it back to its home. As they approached Nicole's condo around midnight, the Akita stopped dead in its tracks, staring toward the entrance of the home. The couple followed the dog's gaze and were horrified to discover Nicole's lifeless body lying outside the house. The police were immediately called, and when they arrived at the scene, they not only found Nicole, but they also stumbled upon Ron Goldman's body lying nearby. It was a gruesome, bloody scene that shook Brentwood, and soon, the entire country. Two people, brutally murdered in one of Los Angeles's most affluent neighborhoods, left more questions than answers in the immediate aftermath. When police arrived at Nicole Brown Simpson's condominium on Bundy Drive, they were met with a gruesome and chilling scene. The front door stood ajar, but there were no signs of forced entry, no broken locks, no smashed windows. It was almost as if the killer had slipped in and out without needing to break anything. Nicole's body was lying face down, barefoot at the base of the stairs leading up to the front door. Her once vibrant life cut tragically short. The walkway leading to those stairs was soaked in blood, but the soles of Nicole's feet remained clean. This detail led investigators to conclude that she had been attacked first, right there on the walkway, and was the primary target. She had suffered multiple stab wounds to her head and neck, but surprisingly few defensive wounds on her hands, suggesting the attack had been swift and overpowering. One final devastating wound had severed her carotid artery, and the brutality didn't end there. A large bruise on her upper back and a footprint on her clothing hinted at the unimaginable that the killer had returned to her after killing Ron Goldman, pulled her head back by her hair, and slit her throat in a violent, final act. Her larynx was exposed through the gaping wound, and one of her vertebrae had been incised, leaving her head barely attached to her body. Nearby, Ron Goldman's body lay crumpled near a tree in the fence. He had clearly been caught in the crossfire of the vicious assault. Stabbed multiple times in his body and neck, like Nicole, he also had few defensive wounds, signaling to investigators that his struggle had been brief. Forensic evidence later revealed a terrifying detail. The killer had likely held Goldman in a chokehold, stabbing him with one hand while restricting his movement with the other. Beside his body lay critical clues, a blue knit cap, a single left-hand glove, extra large, light leather, and the envelope containing Nicole's mother's glasses that Goldman had been returning. The evidence painted a picture of a brutal, almost clinical execution. Investigators surmised that Goldman had arrived during Nicole's murder and was killed simply because he had witnessed the crime. His bravery in the final moments was undeniable, but ultimately, he could do little to fend off the attacker. A trail of bloody shoe prints led away from the scene, through the back gate of Nicole's home. The assailant had left these traces behind, along with drops of blood that investigators believed came from the killer's left hand, which was likely wounded in the attack. Curiously, the distance between the bloody footprints suggested something unusual. The killer had walked away, not run. The deliberate nature of that exit, calm and unhurried, left a chilling air around the crime scene as though the attacker knew they had time on their side. All eyes on Simpson. On the night of June 12, 1994, O.J. Simpson was scheduled to catch a red-eye flight from Los Angeles to Chicago, where he had plans to play golf at a convention for Hertz Corporation, his sponsor. The flight was set to depart at 11.45 p.m., and his limousine driver, Alan Park, arrived at Simpson's Rockingham estate around 10.25 p.m. to pick him up. Arriving early, Park scouted the estate to figure out how to navigate the stretch limousine in the narrow driveways and determine the best entry point for pickup. By 10.40 p.m., Park began buzzing the intercom to alert Simpson, but he got no response. The house remained dark, and no one appeared to be home. Park, growing more concerned, smoked a cigarette while repeatedly calling his boss to obtain Simpson's home phone number. Then something caught his eye. A shadowy African-American figure about the same size as Simpson entered the front door of the estate. The figure appeared just moments before the house lights switched on, but Park couldn't tell from which direction the figure had come. Park also noticed that there was no car parked in front of the house when he first arrived, an important detail given what would be discovered later. 
Prosecutors would later present evidence showing the exact spot where Simpson's white Ford Bronco was parked the next morning, right by the house number on the curb. This detail became crucial in their argument, implying that if the Bronco had been there when Park arrived, he would have undoubtedly seen it. Meanwhile, in the guest house behind Simpson's estate, Cato Kalin, Simpson's friend, who had been staying on the property, was on the phone with a friend. Around 10.40 p.m., Kalin heard three loud thumps against the wall of the guest house, which initially frightened him. Thinking it might be an earthquake, Kalin ended his call and went outside to investigate the noise. However, instead of walking down the dark south pathway where the sounds had originated, he went to the front of the house. There, he saw the limousine waiting outside. At this point, Park was still waiting for Simpson to appear. After Kalin spoke to the driver, Simpson finally emerged from the front door a few minutes later, apologizing for the delay and claiming he had overslept. However, both Park and Kalin later testified that Simpson seemed unusually agitated that night, a small but telling detail that would be scrutinized during the investigation and trial. Nevertheless, Park loaded four pieces of luggage into the car, including a knapsack that Simpson insisted on handling himself. This raised suspicions because, at the airport, a porter noted that Simpson checked only three bags. The missing knapsack became a point of interest, as investigators later believed it contained evidence related to the murders. Witnesses at the airport claimed to have seen Simpson discarding items from a bag into a trash can, leading detectives to suspect that he disposed of crucial evidence, such as the murder weapon, his clothes, and shoes during this time. After arriving in Chicago, Simpson managed to catch his flight, but his actions were under scrutiny. Passengers and the pilot reported no visible injuries on his hands, yet a broken glass, a note with a phone number, and blood-stained bedsheets were later found in his hotel room at the O'Hare Plaza Hotel. Notably, Simpson asked the hotel staff for a Band-Aid for a cut on his finger, claiming it was from handling notepaper. Back in Los Angeles, the investigation into the murders of Nicole Brown Simpson and Ron Goldman escalated. When LAPD Commander Keith Bushy learned of Brown's death, he dispatched detectives to notify Simpson and to pick up the couple's children who were asleep in Brown's condominium. After buzzing the intercom for over half an hour without response, the detectives noted that Simpson's car was parked awkwardly and had blood on the door. Concerned someone inside might be injured, they entered the property without a warrant, citing exigent circumstances. Detective Mark Furman, during his search, discovered a blood-stained right-hand glove in the vicinity, which was later matched to a left-hand glove found at the crime scene. This critical piece of evidence, along with blood in the driveway and on Simpson's vehicle, established probable cause for further investigation. When the police reached Simpson in Chicago, he appeared upset, but oddly unconcerned about the details of Brown's murder. His main inquiry was whether their children had witnessed anything traumatic. During a follow-up questioning, investigators noticed a cut on Simpson's left hand, consistent with a possible struggle. Initially, he claimed the injury was recent, but as details about the blood found in his car emerged, he changed his story, admitting he had cut his finger on June 12th without recalling the specifics. Following the investigation, Simpson hired high-profile lawyer Robert Shapiro, assembling a dream team of legal experts to defend him. As the DNA testing results began to come back, matching Simpson's blood to evidence at the scene, he became increasingly distressed, seeking treatment for depression. The district attorney decided to hold off on filing charges until all results were complete, setting the stage for a dramatic legal battle that would capture national attention. The Investigations After learning of Brown's death, LAPD Commander Keith Bushy instructed detectives to notify O.J. Simpson and to retrieve his children from Brown's condominium, where they had been sleeping during the incident. Upon arriving at Simpson's estate, the detectives encountered a locked gate and an intercom that went unanswered for over 30 minutes. Noticing the suspicious angle of Simpson's parked car and blood on the door, they feared for the safety of anyone inside. Detective Mark Furman scaled the wall to gain access, justifying their entry without a warrant due to what they believed were exigent circumstances. Inside, Furman interviewed Kato Kalin, who had heard strange noises earlier that night. As the detectives surveyed the property, Furman discovered a blood-stained glove, which would later be determined to match a glove found at the murder scene. 
This critical evidence, along with blood found in the driveway and inside Simpson's vehicle, provided enough probable cause to obtain a search warrant. Meanwhile, Simpson was in Chicago, and when detectives called to inform him about Brown's death, he seemed more concerned about whether his children had witnessed the events rather than expressing sorrow for Brown. After returning to Los Angeles, Simpson was brought in for questioning. During this time, detectives noticed a cut on his finger that aligned with the profile of the assailant's injuries, but Simpson initially claimed it was an accident. As evidence mounted, Simpson hired attorney Robert Shapiro, who assembled a high-profile legal team known as the Dream Team. Despite preliminary DNA results linking Simpson to the crime, charges were not immediately filed. By June 17th, after all results were in, detectives recommended charging Simpson with two counts of first-degree murder. When the LAPD informed Shapiro that Simpson needed to turn himself in, Simpson expressed a desire to comply, but his behavior raised alarm. Signs of suicidal thoughts emerged. He had updated his will and left behind sealed letters for his family and the public. The police agreed to delay his surrender for a mental health check, but when the time came, Simpson failed to appear. Instead, he and his friend Al Cowlings went missing, leading the LAPD to declare Simpson a fugitive and issue an all-points bulletin for his arrest. The stage was set for a chase that would enthrall millions, marking the beginning of a media frenzy surrounding the case, the suicide note. At 5 p.m. on June 17, 1994, Robert Kardashian, along with one of Simpson's defense attorneys, publicly read a letter Simpson had written. In it, Simpson expressed his innocence regarding Nicole Brown's murder, reminisced about their tumultuous relationship, and expressed sorrow to his former girlfriend, Paula Barbieri, who had broken up with him just hours before the murders. He urged the media not to disturb his children and wrote poignant lines like, I can't go on, and an apology to the Goldman family. The letter concluded with a declaration of gratitude for his life, asking others to remember the real OJ, Many interpreted this as a suicide note, and the emotional impact was profound. Simpson's mother reportedly collapsed upon hearing it. As the media frenzy intensified, the chase began. At approximately 5.51 p.m., Simpson called 911, and the call was traced to the Santa Ana Freeway. Reports of a white Ford Bronco on the I-5 freeway led to a massive police response. The Bronco, driven by Al Cowlings, became the focus of a slow-speed pursuit, followed by dozens of police cars and an array of news helicopters. During the chase, Cowlings revealed that Simpson was in the back seat with a gun to his head, prompting police to maintain a safe distance. Meanwhile, sports announcer Pete Arbogast contacted Simpson's former coach, John McKay, who urged Simpson to surrender. In a poignant exchange, Simpson promised McKay he wouldn't do anything stupid which many believe prevented him from taking drastic action. As the chase unfolded live on television, it captivated millions of viewers, estimated at around 95 million, resulting in widespread media coverage that interrupted regular programming. Spectators lined overpasses, some encouraging Simpson, creating a bizarre festival atmosphere. The national interest highlighted how deeply intertwined celebrity culture and the judicial process had become. After nearly three hours, the chase ended at Simpson's Brentwood estate around 8 p.m. Simpson spent 45 minutes in the Bronco before surrendering. Police later discovered significant items in the vehicle, including cash, a loaded .357 Magnum, and a disguise kit, which raised further suspicions. Despite the weight of the suicide note and the dramatic chase, these pieces of evidence were ultimately not presented during the criminal trial. Prosecutor Marcia Clark acknowledged that they suggested guilt, but chose to exclude them, arguing that the media spectacle had already compromised the trial's integrity. While many viewed Simpson's actions as an admission of guilt, a substantial segment of the public empathized with him, reflecting the complex dynamics of fame, justice, and public perception that surrounded the case. At 5 p.m. on June 17, 1994, Robert Kardashian, along with one of Simpson's defense attorneys, publicly read a letter Simpson had written. In it, Simpson expressed his innocence regarding Nicole Brown's murder, reminisced about their tumultuous relationship, and expressed sorrow to his former girlfriend, Paula Barbieri. 
who had broken up with him just hours before the murders. He urged the media not to disturb his children and wrote poignant lines like, I can't go on, and an apology to the Goldman family. The letter concluded with a declaration of gratitude for his life, asking others to remember the real OJ. Many interpreted this as a suicide note, and the emotional impact was profound. Simpson's mother reportedly collapsed upon hearing it. As the media frenzy intensified, the chase began. At approximately 5.51 p.m., Simpson called 911, and the call was traced to the Santa Ana Freeway. Reports of a white Ford Bronco on the I-5 freeway led to a massive police response. The Bronco, driven by Al Cowlings, became the focus of a slow-speed pursuit, followed by dozens of police cars and an array of news helicopters. During the chase, Cowlings revealed that Simpson was in the back seat with a gun to his head, prompting police to maintain a safe distance. Meanwhile, sports announcer Pete Arbogast contacted Simpson's former coach, John McKay, who urged Simpson to surrender. In a poignant exchange, Simpson promised McKay he wouldn't do anything stupid, which many believe prevented him from taking drastic action. As the chase unfolded live on television, it captivated millions of viewers, estimated at around 95 million, resulting in widespread media coverage that interrupted regular programming. Spectators lined overpasses, some encouraging Simpson, creating a bizarre festival atmosphere. The national interest highlighted how deeply intertwined celebrity culture and the judicial process had become. After nearly three hours, the chase ended at Simpson's Brentwood estate around 8 p.m. Simpson spent 45 minutes in the Bronco before surrendering. Police later discovered significant items in the vehicle, including cash, a loaded .357 Magnum, and a disguise kit which raised further suspicions. Despite the weight of the suicide note and the dramatic chase, these pieces of evidence were ultimately not presented during the criminal trial. Prosecutor Marsha Clark acknowledged that they suggested guilt, but chose to exclude them, arguing that the media spectacle had already compromised the trial's integrity. While many viewed Simpson's actions as an admission of guilt, a substantial segment of the public empathized with him, reflecting the complex dynamics of fame, justice, and public perception that surrounded the case. The trial. On June 20th, 1994, Simpson was arraigned, pleading not guilty to the charges and being held without bail. This set the stage for a grand jury to determine whether there was enough evidence for an indictment. However, the grand jury was dismissed just days later on June 23rd, due to the overwhelming media coverage that raised concerns about impartiality. Instead, a probable cause hearing was held, where California Superior Court Judge Kathleen Kennedy Powell evaluated the evidence. On July 7th, she ruled that there was sufficient basis to bring Simpson to trial. At his second arraignment on July 22nd, Simpson emphatically stated, absolutely, 100% not guilty. Key testimonies during this period included Jill Shively, who claimed to have seen a white Ford Bronco speeding from the murder scene. However, her credibility came into question after it was revealed she had sold her story for $5,000 and previously made false claims about being assaulted. Another significant piece of evidence was the purchase of a knife by Jose Camacho, which was similar to the one believed to have caused the fatal stab wounds. However, the prosecution chose not to present this evidence during the trial, partly due to Camacho's financial motives in selling his story. A notable incident involved former NFL player Rosie Greer, who visited Simpson in jail. Greer testified that Simpson expressed remorse and stated, I didn't mean to do it. However, this testimony was deemed inadmissible due to clergy penitent privilege. Simpson's defense attempted to propose a theory involving hitmen connected to drug dealers, suggesting they were responsible for the murders due to debts owed by Brown's friend. Judge Ito ultimately dismissed this theory as speculative and without evidence. As the preliminary hearing progressed, media coverage intensified, becoming a national obsession. The trial itself was later described as a media circus, with extensive coverage overshadowing significant events, including the Bosnian War and the Oklahoma City bombing. This marked a turning point in how legal proceedings were reported and consumed by the public, establishing a new era of trial by media.
What do you think? Did the media coverage skew public perception or did it reflect deeper societal issues? Share your thoughts in the comments below. If you found this deep dive into the trial of the century engaging, make sure to like, subscribe, and hit that notification bell for more in-depth stories that shape our understanding of justice and culture. Thanks for joining us, and we'll see you in the next video.